you know, a, a, an accumulation of all the different kinds of interventions that we use. The current approaches that are what I would call evidence-based approaches, where they've got a scientific literature that backs them up, um, are generally derived from models of chronic illness management. So, so it is something that was developed for people with multimorbidity, uh, chronic health conditions that persist for you know, weeks and months and years. Self-management uh, is, is a behavioral intervention, but there is an abundant literature that shows that self-management, I'm using the acronym SM here, um, actually has biological effects. So if you look at stress hormones in the bodies, if you looked at markers of biological inflammation, you can see changes uh, in the positive direction when self-management, um, evidence-based self-management approaches are applied. You can see changes in heart rate var variability where the variability kind of levels out. So these behavioral changes can actually have real biologic outcomes. Unfortunately, there are a variety of things that um, impede epilepsy self-management or a, a person's own ability to <clears throat> kind of affect outcomes for themselves. These are some of the common ones that I have listed here, but it is by no means an all-inclusive list. So for example, forgetting to take anti-epileptic drugs or medications is one common reason. A uh, lack of understanding of treatment goals. So what is generally true for most medications used for epilepsy is that they're prophylactic. They're intended to prevent seizures rather than um, used when seizures happen. Um, you know, I think most people get that sort of um, intellectually, but very often what we see is that when people really get their seizures well under control, they haven't had a seizure in a long time, um, may, may really not see a need for continued medication treatment. And we know that that often has unfortunate outcomes. There is the very real issue of suboptimal medication efficacy. So medications work generally, uh, but they don't work in everyone and not every medication works for everyone. So that is often trial and error between a clinician and a person with epilepsy, and it can be frustrating and sometimes uh, take a while to find a, a medication or a medication cocktail that, that works for a person. Side effects are unfortunately really prevalent and often become very burdensome where the person may think, oh, you know, the benefit of this just does not outweigh the burden. As is the case for many people with chronic health conditions, depression, uh, anxiety, and other psychiatric symptoms are relatively common. Unfortunately, epilepsy remains a stigmatized condition, uh, similar to many of our, our psychiatric conditions. Lack of social support, and some of that is um, indirect effects of epilepsy. So again, if you can't drive and you can't get around, you'll have fewer uh, supportive people around you potentially. And then lack of access to care uh, and medications and other type of interventions, unfortunately, still fairly common in our society. So we know that epilepsy self-management works, um, that it has a variety of positive effects. How do we take that information and apply it so it actually helps people? And um, a basis of, of much of my work over the last decade and a half is feeling strongly that we need to develop epilepsy self-medication, self-management programs that are proven. So we need to um, show that they're, they're evidence-based. And then we need to figure out how to get these evidence-based epilepsy self-management programs to the people and the families that need them most. And uh, bullet point one doesn't automatically translate to bullet point two. So just because you have a, um, a a program or an intervention or curriculum that works in a sort of laboratory perfect setting doesn't mean that it's going to be um, easy to scale it up and, and incorporate it into real world practices. So this is where I want to shift gears a little bit and share with you um, uh, some information about the group that I've been working with for, um, for about 10 years now. This is a um, research consortium called the Managing Epilepsy Well, or MU Network. The MU Network is an effort that has been funded by, by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. Um, and they've been very, very committed to supporting the work of us and our um, academic centers that are scattered across the United States. 
the mission of the MU network is to advance science related to epilepsy self-management by facilitating and implementing research, conducting research in collaboration with network and community stakeholders, and then broadly disseminating the findings of this research. So it's really kind of a continuum. First of all, develop and test the research. So find approaches that work, partner with the customers that need them to figure out how to best scale them up and then to scale them up. So it is a, it's, it's a process. Um, the CDC MU network has been in operation now for a little over a decade. Uh, in, this, in this current uh, iteration, uh, what we call a funding cycle, so the CDC funds us for five years roughly at a time. There are, uh, the centers are located here. You can see the maps of the US. And um, here you see uh, Case Western. Case Western has partnered recently, uh, actually just starting in 2019, with the University of Iowa. So we represent, and I think part of the reason why we were able to get funded is we, we kind of represent the heartland here. If you look at where all the other centers are, I don't know if my, I can get my little cursor to, to roll around here, but um, you can see that many of the centers are, are kind of coastally located. So we really um, are novel both in some of our unique approaches as well as our, our where we are geographically in the, in the United States. The MU network has um, developed a, um, uh, you know, kind of a, a spectrum of relationships. The collaboration is very important. Uh, if, if you look at collaborations here, the second bullet point of collaborative activities, our, our case team has helped develop something called the MU database project, which means that we take all of the clinical trials that have been done in epilepsy self-management over the last decade and uh, integrate and merge all of that data so that we can do secondary data analyses from, those, uh, from, from that data and learn more about uh, oh, a variety of different outcomes. So for instance, we can look at how certain uh, racial or ethnic minorities might do or not do with the programs. We might look at older people or younger people, um, adolescents or youth, um, you know, sort of in, in, in relationship to what's known nationally. We continue to do research and we, um, we partner with a variety of stakeholders in the community. At, at Case Western, um, with our center, we've had um, very, very good fortune to be a partner with the Epilepsy Association here in Cleveland almost since we began. Their support of our work and our programming has been invaluable. I think it's bi-directional. We've been able to help each other offer programs and services to our community that I don't think would be otherwise available. So it's really been a win-win situation. If we look at the landscape, um, for those of you who uh, you know, maybe want to know more about the different types of epilepsy self-management programs that are out there, there are many of them. Uh, not all have been developed by the MU network. Uh, this is, this is a, a global uh, initiative, although I, I'd like to feel good about saying that our, our MU network and our US investigators have really helped be in the forefront here. But uh, we can see that, that this is a little graph that shows the priority populations for different programs. Um, the range of, of target populations, so some epilepsy self-management programs target adults, some children or youth, racial and ethnic minorities. There's some programs for military veterans, people with intellectual disability, uh, and people with epilepsy and comorbid serious mental illness. The intensity varies from very brief interventions that take four hours to those that are over 40 hours. Some are delivered in hour-long sessions held over the course of a few weeks. That's true of the programs that we've developed here at, in Cleveland. Others um, might be just through one or two day workshops, so it really varies. With respect to the types of delivery, you know, so how do these, how do these programs get delivered? Some are done in person or a distance. Um, just like we're doing this, this Zoom call now, we are increasingly delivering our programs via the internet or mobile devices. I think that's going to be um, a bigger and bigger market share and bigger consideration for us as we try to make these programs available for people who may have transportation problems, who may be in rural settings, or, or just may have other limitations on their movement as, 
as we all see now with the uh, COVID-19 experience. Who are the personnel that can deliver the epilepsy self-management? Uh, that varies just like the different types of interventions. Some programs use nurse, nurse practitioners or um, uh, you know, nurses that have any type of educational background, physicians, mental health professionals. In our programs developed by CASE, we tend to use trained peer educators. So those are people with epilepsy who are trained to deliver these curriculums and, and we have found a great success with that. And then this bottom line here shows you the target. So what are the, what are the outcomes that improve with epilepsy self-management? And those can be varied. They depend on the type of intervention involved. Quality of life is a common outcome, mental health, depressive symptoms or anxiety, uh, seizure symptoms. So we can look at seizure frequency, you know, how many, maybe somebody has a seizure on average uh, three or four times a month. And then when they have their epilepsy self-management program and they've accomplished the curriculum and have learned some skills, they may be down to uh, you know, a seizure once a month or every other month and that we would consider that a, a win. Other behavioral factors, people may feel more confident about uh, managing their epilepsy. And then there are some additional uh, things that I haven't listed on here like uh, costs and complications. I'm happy to um, address any comments or questions afterwards where we can talk about different things that people might be able to expect or not expect with epilepsy self-management programs. So what I want to do here now is, is quickly review the MU network evidence-based program. So what are the programs that are out there that have been tested and proven to be uh, efficacious? There are um, a number of them. The two that our, our case team developed are um, number one, the TIME program, Targeted Self-Management for Epilepsy and Mental Illness. So this is a program that targets people who have two chronic health conditions, epilepsy and different types of mental illness, such as depression uh, or bipolar disorder. We have another program that um, was an outgrowth of the TIME program. That's the SMART, uh, Self-Management for People with Epilepsy and Recent Negative Health Events. We define a health event, a negative health event as having a seizure, or a hospitalization, an ER visit, um, or other um, health outcomes that I think most people would agree are not desirable and, and not something that you know, somebody would want to happen to them. One of the early programs developed through the MU network was something called Webbies. It's an epilepsy awareness support and education program, uh, an online self-management uh, program. That, um, that program, uh, my understanding is they are working on doing some updates to Webby, so stay tuned for those that are interested more in that program. A program that has had more recent activity is one called Uplift, or using practice and learning to increase favorable thoughts. So that's a mindfulness approach to uh, improving health outcomes in people with epilepsy and mild depression. Uh, another one that's, that's sort of intriguing uh, and is definitely on the upswing in terms of getting scaled up is a program called Hopscotch, Home-Based Self-Management and Cognitive Training Changes Lives. So that was developed by the team at Dartmouth College. And uh, the, the primary outcomes of that is to improve cognitive functioning or memory and focus. Uh, for any of these, if you're interested in hearing more about these, I would encourage you to go to the MU Network website. If you just go on the web and type in uh, Managing Epilepsy Well or MU Network, this will, this will pop up. It's a CDC website and you can read more about any of these particular programs. Other programs are the PEARLS program, um, which is focused on older people with epilepsy, and a program uh, out of the University of Washington called PACES, the Program of Active Consumer Engagement and Self-Management Epilepsy. And these are in-person phone group sessions targeting mood and cognitive management. So um, I, I, I alluded a little bit to the self-management programs that have been developed in our community. Uh, we have developed um, these, these two evidence-based programs, uh, TIME and, um, and SMART. They have focused on people who have mental health comorbidity and those who've had a hard time controlling their seizures. So we would consider those both to be um, high need groups of people. 
let me speak a little bit about the background that led to our development of the TIME program and why I think epilepsy self-management is particularly important in people who have depression, anxiety, or other types of, of mental health symptoms. We know that somewhere in the order of 20 to 70 percent of people with epilepsy will meet criteria for a psychiatric disorder at some point in their life. And um, depression is common. Uh, one systematic review found that anywhere between uh, just over 13 percent to over 36 percent of people have depression. And um, people with epilepsy have nearly three times the odds of having depression compared to those without epilepsy. So when we did our time project, we, uh, we, we conducted in two phases, and this is true of the way we develop most of our programs, is you know, we don't just develop something and then go out and test it in the community. We believe it's really critical to do a needs assessment first and base our program on um, what our, our customers or our stakeholders feel is most important to have in a epilepsy self-management intervention. So we, we convened a community advisory board. We took about 10 months to have them give input on the barriers and facilitators to epilepsy self-management for people who have epilepsy and serious mental illness. And then um, over the next year to year and a half, we did a randomized trial where we, we, we enrolled 44 people. Half of them got uh, randomized to our time program and half of them had treatment as usual. We followed them for four months and our, our primary outcome or the thing that we hoped to change was depressive symptom severity. And actually this is what we found. Uh, we published this data in a journal called Epilepsy and Behavior in 2016. So what this shows you is the total score on a rating scale called the Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale. So it's a standardized scale that, that measures um, how severe a person's depressive symptoms are. And the scoring ranges anywhere between zero to about 30. Um, and what, we, what we've plotted here is the time group, so depression severity versus the uh, treatment as usual group. So people who went in our program for four months versus those who just had their, their standard care. And uh, what you wanna see is, if, it's, if things are going in the correct direction, is you wanna see a reduction in the total score on the Montgomery Asperg Depression Rating Scale, or MADRAS. In fact, um, that, that's what you see here, is that over the course of four months, as you can see, the two groups started off pretty close. The, um, the group that were in treatment as usual got a little bit worse, while the people that were in the time group, that's the blue line here, got significantly better. And it was both clinically and statistically significant. So we were, we were pretty excited about that. Uh, we, we were enthusiastic. Uh, we you know, were interested in taking our work further, but, but there were a few significant problems with the time intervention. One is that it was done in person. So you know that's hard if somebody can't get to a particular center. We were doing it in our offices at Case Western. We did some groups at the Epilepsy Association. Um, you know, they're nice supportive settings, but not everybody could make it. And additionally, we wanted to see whether um, our program did more than improve depressive symptoms. Improving depression is important. It's important to, to people with epilepsy and their families. It may be less important to people who um, provide insurance coverage or pay Medicare or pay Medicaid. So we wanted to focus on an outcome that would be important to payers as well as patients and family members. So um, we developed a program called SMART, it was self-management for people with epilepsy and a history of negative health events. There's two steps to it. Uh, step one is a group format, in-person 60 to 90 minute session, so one session. And then step two is seven group format sessions delivered remotely um, using a web-based format, uh, actually identical to what I'm doing here today. So, you know, people could see posters and graphics, and then we also had an interactive discussion. A telephone call in line was available for those who uh, don't have internet access or prefer not to use the web. The group sessions were completed over about eight weeks, 
and we had a detailed curriculum and uh, really detailed instructions for the delivery of the program. Let me let me just back up for a second. So, you know, what's really unique about both Time and Smart is the um, is this co-delivery by the nurse educator and peer educator diet. And what that means is the program is delivered by a nurse. Doesn't have to be an epilepsy specialist nurse. Actually, that's not even my preference. I'd rather have a nurse who um, perhaps has a little bit of an education background, and then a peer educator, so a person with epilepsy. And they don't have to be, you know, the world's expert in epilepsy self-management. I happen to believe we learn more by our mistakes than by our, by our successes sometimes. But, uh, but this STEP SMART program is delivered by this nurse educator and the peer educator, and they really are a team, deliver the program collaboratively, and I feel that this is one of uh, the program's strengths. This is what the SMART curriculum looks like. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but as I mentioned, there's eight sessions. Each session, which lasts about an hour, 60 to 90 minutes, covers a, a variety of topics. We, uh, we include problem solving skills, holistic issues like nutrition, exercise, uh, reducing or minimizing risk of substance use uh, or substance abuse, abuse, social supports and using available supports. How, how might a person um, partner with advocacy and social services agencies like the Epilepsy Association? and normalizing their life in spite of having a chronic but unpredictable condition. So we can, we can talk about the curriculum afterwards if folks have questions, but I, I don't wanna you know, spend your time necessarily reading slides today. So we did this study. We enrolled 120 people with epilepsy and um, they, they were either randomized to our SMART program versus a wait list where they just got their regular care. Our primary outcome was what we call NHE count. So how many seizures, ER visits, hospitalizations, and so on did you have in the last six months? So we, we measure, measured change in NHE counts for the last six months so that uh, column on the left, the white column on the left is the SMART group, and the white column on the right is the wait list, W group. Okay, and we can see the percent decrease in total NHE count. So everybody had a decrease. That's not terribly surprising in a research study where people are getting a little support and encouragement that they normally wouldn't get, but we see that the percentage of decrease was significantly and substantially greater in the SMART arm, um, a, a change in total NHEs. We did not see a change in seizure counts at that kind of single NHE count level, but cumulatively, we saw a significant difference favoring SMART. These are some of the other variables. So the PHQ-9 is the nine-item patient health questionnaire, which measures depression severity. Um, you already heard me mention the Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale, or MADRAS, like we used in the TIME study, and the 10-item quality of life inventory. So those are three uh, important outcomes in epilepsy research, and we saw that compared to wait lists, SMART was superior in all of those domains. So improving self-rated and observer-rated depressive symptom severity, as well as quality of life. I mentioned already that the CASE team is leading this Managing Epilepsy Well Integrated Database. We currently have about 1,800 unique individuals from 16 epilepsy self-management studies. Um, here are just a, a bullet list of some of the publications that have been come out over the last half dozen years. Um, we were looking at demographic and clinical correlates of seizure frequency. We've looked at a subgroup of African Americans. So there haven't really been very many research studies on epilepsy self-management in African Americans. Most of the time the samples are really small, but we have enough when we pool all of our data to have collective strength and we can do some secondary data analysis looking at subgroups um, because we have the power of, of just big data here. 
one recent publication that we had that came out, came out um, last year in Epilepsia is we wanted to know if we took all of these evidence-based epilepsy self-management programs and asked the question, in general, if a person with epilepsy enrolls or engages in an epilepsy self-management program, will their depression get better over time? So we, so we went into our pooled MU database and we took five studies that were randomized controlled trials. That is, they, they enrolled people and some proportion of the sample was, was randomized to the epilepsy self-management program and the other half did treatment as usual or wait list. Uh, we found five studies that met those criteria. Sample size was 472. And what, what this graph shows you is the change in the uh, nine item patient health questionnaire, which is a self rated depressive symptom severity index. So, what you want to see with the PHQ 9 is lower scores. The lower your score, the less depressed you are. And so, what this is showing you is this black line here is people that are randomized to um, control or wait list. And the dotted blue line is people who are randomized to one of our epilepsy self-management programs. And what you see is over the course of three visits, on average, this is anywhere from six to six months to a year, is you see a significant reduction in, ep in depressive symptoms if you are enrolled in epilepsy self-management studies. So we take that as sort of a general endorsement of our programs. People may, um, be a better fit for one particular epilepsy self-management program or, or another. But in general, we can say that um, if somebody goes into one of these programs, they can expect at the very least a reduction in depression. So I want to um, wind up the last portion of my talk with, um, you know, looking forward, what next? The CDC has funded us for a new funding cycle. We just got funded this past October for five more years of funding to do some additional work. We're calling it SMART 2.0. So we have two phases. We are um, refining our SMART program to um, be able to be uh, available to people in rural and underserved communities. This is a collaboration that we've started with the University of Iowa in Iowa City. We've not collaborated with them in the past, but so far it's just been a, a stellar collaboration. They're a terrific group. They have a big epilepsy self-management center, but most of the people that they serve do live in rural communities. Um, so we are in the process now of getting some um, focus groups set up, and then uh, phase two will be an 18-month randomized control trial of SMART, this new and improved version of SMART compared to a six-month waitlist control. Um, what we have in our new program is that it's 100% virtual, so it can be accessed by people with epilepsy from their homes. So, um, you know, we were, I guess, in a way, uh, kind of ahead of the curve, so to speak, with COVID-19, but, um, you know, we, we were originally thinking that this would be ideal for folks that are um, in rural settings, but, you know, if we, if we are in social distancing or in a situation, even if there's lots of folks around you, but you can't physically interact with them, then these remote uh, delivery systems can be quite helpful. Our phase one logistics are intended to set the stage for a successful randomized control trial in SMART, SMART 2.0. Uh, we're doing uh, focus groups using qualitative research methods. So we bring together about eight individuals, people with epilepsy and their family members from rural communities in Iowa. We're also doing focus groups composed of uh, rural health providers, social services agencies. We will have a community advisory board made up of um, participants from Iowa and, uh, and Ohio. So uh, the Epilepsy uh, Association in Cleveland will be uh, represented on this board. We think that's important. They were very, very solid supporters from the beginning and we hope to continue that engagement. We will do video conference calls just like I'm doing today to help us um, continue to refine the SMART program and we need their input. So um, I, I won't belabor this, but for our um, phase one, where we're getting um, input on how we can improve our, um, our, our program, we're enrolling people who have a diagnosis of epilepsy who have experienced at least 
three negative health events in their lifetime. That's described as a seizure, a hospitalization, emergency department visit, or a self-harm attempt. And then in phase two, we're going to enroll 160 people. 60 of them will uh, go immediately into our SMART 2.0 program. Uh, the other half, or so I guess it's 80, I'm sorry, 80 and 80 uh, will go, 80 will go to the wait list program. And then um, since SMART is an adjunct or intended to be a complement to ongoing neurological and medical care, people will continue to see their neurologists, their primary care providers, et cetera. And, and get their regular medical services. I just wanna say a, a couple of issues that I thought might be um, relevant to this audience because we do go out to the community and we, and we say, we're looking for people who um, you know, wanna be in our programs. We're looking for people who might be interested in peer education and being a peer educator. We definitely encourage that. Uh, an important point for us is group confidentiality. Um, we try to normalize mental health comorbidity. Um, we normalize difficulties in staying on uh, anti-epileptic drugs. So we say that what you know is said in the group stays, stays in the group, but we also normalize it. We don't say, oh, you know, you're a bad person because you, you missed three or four days in the last week of your anti-epileptic drug adherence. But this is something that, that most people work their way through and how can you successfully overcome that? Um, with respect to people being peer educators, um, it is additional effort on top of having a chronic illness. We do compensate people uh, modestly. They're not going to, um, because nobody's going to become wealthy doing this, but, but we do believe in a respectful compensation of time. We teach people how to um, honor their own interpersonal boundaries and being a, um, being a peer educator. Our experience is that being a peer educator can, can be a very powerful experience. It's empowering, confidence building. And for some of our peer educators, uh, it has been, I would say, relatively transformative. Other things that we um, emphasize with our peer educators is respecting diversity. Confidentiality is also a, a, a big issue with us. And being honest about your own situation. People are not obligated to share personal experiences if that's not comfortable for them. What we have found is that once people um, kind of get comfortable with the idea that this is sort of their tribe, there are other people who are walking the walk with you, that it's okay to share and we can really learn from each other with sharing. We teach people to be aware of their limits and boundaries and how their behavior can affect others. Self-management is not about solving someone's problems. So you cannot solve and should not try to solve other people's problems, but maybe your experience can help them to solve their own problems. Um, we do spend a fair bit of uh, time and effort talking about, you know, um, if there are behaviors that seem to you that it's crossing the line or, or you know, maybe something that shouldn't be going on, discuss it with the program staff. So, um, so we give people, uh, I would say, fairly uh, robust support in that prospect and being respectable of other people's time and effort. So um, we do ask our peer educators to make that commitment to be reliable, to show up, to call in uh, when, when group sessions happen. And it is a fairly uh, intensive commitment for the peer educators. So in conclusion, epilepsy self-management programs can help people with epilepsy improve their lives and health. There are a variety of evidence-based programs that have been developed. Some of them are available in our communities. Some, some of them are available uh, nationally. And the new research that's ongoing is expected to scale up the reach of programs like SMART and deliver the benefits, their benefits, to people with epilepsy who have historically been underserved. So let me... Um, Should I, should I stop my, my share at this point or do you want me to just leave this up and, and open this up to questions? Uh, yeah, you can stop it at this point and I can put ours back up. We have a couple of slides at the end. Okay. But yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to submit them via the chat feature. Um, if you scroll over to the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat feature. Um, feel free to send those in. 
Nicole, would it be would it be totally out of line to to lift the mute and let people just ask their question? Um, just because we're recording. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. we're just gonna. All say right. Yeah. Okay. I, I see that we've got um, a couple of our, our peer educators and our nurse educators on the line. I wondered if I might be able to ask uh, a nurse educator to maybe say a couple of words about what that experience has been like for them as a nurse educator in the program. Would that be okay? Yeah, that would be great. Do we have any one of our, our nurse educators be willing to step up to the plate and give a one minute blurb? Let me see. Hi, it's Eleanor. Hey, Eleanor. Eleanor is uh, one of our nurse educators par excellence. They're all par excellence, but uh, Eleanor has probably been with us the longest, huh? I, I guess so. Hard to believe. Um, it was really interesting, Dr. Sajadovic, to hear what people are doing at some of the other locations and exciting that it's expanding out to Iowa. And I'm glad to hear that collaboration is going well. Um, we just finished, or well, I'm still, I still have a second phone call to make to all the participants who were part of the um, smaller group that we've done just through the Epilepsy Association, so, you know, totally community-based. And um, that, I think, went pretty well. Uh, the thing, the, one of the things that really amazed me, uh, having done the first sessions in the TIME program that were all in person, and when you asked us to do it, you know, as a virtual meeting situation, I know I thought, oh, this is not going to work. People are not going to talk or, you know, it just will be too difficult. But I was, I'm constantly amazed at how well it does work doing it virtually. Um, that people do engage, people do share, people do seem to get a lot out of it. So I think that's very encouraging. Um, that that works so well. And then again, I can't say enough about the peer educator uh, part. Uh, I think they are truly the uh, key to the whole group. Um, I see my role as, you know, more giving some of the classroom information and keeping the group moving and those kind of things. But the peer educator is the one that the participants really focus on and really listen to. And I think it makes a huge difference to them to hear their stories of where they've been and where they are now. Um, so I think that that's truly the most important part. Great, thank you, Eleanor. That's super helpful. Um, Nicole, do you want to talk about maybe maybe um, before we see if there's a peer educator who might be willing to give say a word or two? Do you want to go through your next slide because I think they might give a little context here um, to give people some bead on the the opportunities that are going on right now, right this second. Yeah, and we do have a couple questions that are coming in. I don't know if you can see those, Dr. Sjedovic, um, but somebody asked, "How could I learn more about possibly being a peer educator?" Let me hold that question for a second because uh, I think they're good. Maybe Nicole, you can go through your next couple sure. slides first and then let me let me circle back to that question. Sure. So I did just want to say um, right now we uh, like um, Eleanor was just sharing. We actually um, Epilepsy Association just finished up um, an eight week session of the SMART program. So we're offering this as a community based program right now. Um, I agree, I think it, it went really well. Folks were able to, um, to call in um, those who, a lot of the folks um, that were in this past group did not have internet access, didn't have access to a computer, which is not a barrier for this program. Um, they were able to just call into the group. I think that they were still able to get just as much out of it 
um, everybody gets a um, participant manual so they're able to follow along you know with any slides that we would have on the screen um, so they're still able to participate in that way uh, and I think it went it went really well we're still just finishing up some follow-up um, and we're planning on starting another group um, Wednesday April 8th um, so it will be from 1 to 2 30 p.m. depending on how long the groups take um, I think that I still have maybe two spots open um, in that one. So if anyone is interested, please, um, we're working remotely right now. So you can contact me um, at the agency um, at 216-579-1330. I'm at extension 17. You can leave me a message and I'll call you back um, or you can send me an email at nrichter at epilepsyinfo.org. Um, and then, yeah, I'm hoping that maybe we can have a peer educator. I don't know if Michael is on the call, if you wanted to say anything um, about that. But what I did just want to mention too, we are having, we will be holding our regular adult support group. We're going to be doing that virtually. Um, that also is on April 8th, just coincidentally, um, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So feel free to get a hold of me um, and I can send you um, information about logging on to to, um, to that group. Um, and then our next seminar um, will be Wednesday, May 13th. Um, look for more info for that on our website, epilepsyinfo.org, um, and to register. And um, Colleen, let me unmute you. Um, I don't know if you had anything else that you wanted to, to add. After we're done with um, uh, the questions and so forth, I can run through the last couple things. Um, okay. Why don't Why don't we do this? Why don't we get uh, a couple words from Michael? Maybe his sort of one minute blurb on being a peer educator, and then I'd like to um, answer the question that we got from Rick. I think about possibly being a peer educator. So, Michael, do you want to give us your your two cents on this? This um, whole experience since um, the beginning of time, no pun intended. Um, I feel that the role of being a parent educator is very complementary to the role of nurse educator. As I explain it to each session, that the nurse educator is the book smart half of it and the parent educator the street smarts half of it. Um, the thing that I find most amazing is how serious that the participants take it when a lot of times for the first time they're meeting another individual with epilepsy. And I've experienced that myself when, when I first started. And when they're listening to an individual who has epilepsy that's going through what they're going through and can relate to what they've experienced, I feel they take the program 40 times more seriously. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think that's true. We've, we've heard that again and again that, you know, um, the, the peer educators are really sort of the secret sauce, I think, to the, to the program. So we're enormously grateful to Michael and our many other peer educators who um, have helped our program be what it is. Let me, let me turn, uh, we just, just to, to wind up here, the question about um, being a peer educator so uh, if you reach out to Nicole Richter and you have Nicole's email there, I would say contact her. Nicole can forward, um, depending on your circumstances and your questions, either to me here, uh, Martha Sajadovic, or, or um, our, our current uh, research coordinator on this project, Carrie Zimmerman, who can then uh, give you more information and let you know what opportunities are, are ongoing. We do have the Epilepsy Association doing their, their programs, but also we have some new research projects, uh, including SMART 2.0, and then there's another one that is, I think, looming on the horizon. So we're always looking for additional um, good people who are interested in being peer educators. It's a, it's a task, but um, I, I think it could be a tremendously rewarding task. So let me, let me stop there and turn things over to Colleen. 
Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Savjadovic. We really appreciate you presenting on this topic today, and thank you all for joining um, this online seminar. We hope you found the information um, helpful and informative. Uh, we will be sending out a brief email survey um, after the seminar concludes, so if you can just keep an eye out for it and um, fill that out and send that back to us, we would really appreciate it. Um, as Nicole said, we have an upcoming seminar in May. Just keep an eye out for additional details on that. Um, at this point, the, the next seminar and the remaining seminars we have throughout our seminar series program will be in person. But if anything were to change, just um, continue to check back at our website and we will notify anyone who's already RSVP'd. Um, we do have spe several other special events coming up um, as Purple Day is tomorrow, and we will not only be celebrating it this week, but throughout the course of the year. So definitely look at our website for activities that we will have as part of our Purple Year Year campaign. Um, and lastly, Nicole had already talked about um, the adult group, but if anyone's interested, uh, please reach out to her to get registered. And Again, thank you for attending um, our seminar. Hopefully um, you found this information helpful and we look forward to seeing you at uh, future events. So stay safe, everyone.